Hello, this is going to be a CLI Magic variety show. It's a uh, just something I wanted to try out where we're going to cover many different things. Uh, a few days ago I had posted a, well, actually it was a week ago, I posted a poor man's file receiving server tip where I used a while loop to um, and netcat to receive files just from anybody anonymously and write them out to the disk just to show how easy it was to do. Um, that was done just by using a while loop and instead of saying something like true or read you actually just ran the netcat command like this uh, telling it that you want it to listen which is the dash o option on port 4000 and write out anything it receives to a file named according to what the current epoch time is. Uh, so use the prefix uh, word output and then epic seconds in Unix time is signified by percent %s and date. So it's going to write out a file that's called output dash and then the epic time according to um, when netcat starts running. So as soon as I run the while loop, it's going to start running. It's going to write out a file right away and just leave it open until somebody writes something to it. And then when the remote connection closes, it'll close out the file and exit. And then the while loop will run again. So if we run this, and it's running now, and I can just open up another terminal window and if I run netstat and grep for port 4000 you'll see here that it's listening on any interface port 4000 so I can you know you can do something like telnet to port 4000 and it'll show that it's opening up the connection whenever you see this kind of this line, this escape character, that mean, that's telling it basically saying, okay, I've established a TCP handshake and I've opened up the port, so you can go ahead and start sending stuff. So if I wanted to, in this case, there's no protocol, it's just raw data. And I could just say, you know, hello, foobar. And this gets, this will get written out to the file. You'll see over on the other window where I'm running the netcat receiving uh, server, it shows that I made a connection from the localhost IP and it accepted the connection. When I'm done, I can just hit uh, control and then the right square bracket. And that that's a way to escape out to Telnet's um, command mode so I can type quit. And this is all being done on the same computer. Normally, you know, uh, you would do this across, you know, the network or something, the whole internet. And if I look at this file, it shows exactly what I typed in. So to demonstrate this so that people could send, you know, files and see how easy it is to set up a server, I actually set up a, uh, one of my own servers ran this while loop with netcat for a week and I encourage people to send just anonymous files up to it and so on this video I'm actually going to unveil what people sent me which probably will be interesting to a lot of you just to see what random things people sent I was interested you know the internet used to be a lot more experimental and just kind of raw and I wanted to get a little bit of that feeling back uh, in doing this for everybody, you know, not just for me, but uh, people who sent it probably felt that uh, feeling that they could, they, you know, who knows who's going to view whatever I'm sending, and and I have no idea what people are going to send. Maybe they'll send viruses. Um, so to see this, I'm actually going to use a program called SSHFS, which I've I've talked about before, but maybe uh, if, if you didn't catch that tip. SSHFS is a, a way of remotely mounting 
a file system over an SSH tunnel. Uh, very handy utility. It uses something called the Fuse module. Uh, fuse meaning file system and user space. Uh, and that's a Linux thing, so if you're using a Mac or other Unix, you probably won't be able to do this. Um, I don't know where somebody has made an SSHFS equivalent for Mac or not. Probably. Open source is full of good, good stuff. So I'm going to just establish the connection. And basically, you would type in SSH the same way that you you know would if you're connecting to get a shell. All right, I need to make a directory to mount to. Yeah, so if you're wondering why I did there. I commented out the command I was about to run using um, hash character and then hit enter to save it in my history so I could go back to it, which is also another very useful thing. And so I tell it that I want to connect to the user suso at aquarium.suso.com. The colon is uh, using a colon without a mount point after it like directly after it basically just means that I want to mount the home directory for the SUSU user and I'm going to mount that to the aquarium directory on the local side and that's right hang on for a second since this is the first time I'm connecting from this host I need to accept the SSH key and now I'm Notice I haven't actually, I mean, I've logged into the remote system, but it hasn't given me a shell there. But if I run DF, you'll see that it uh, has mounted that remote directory and tied it to my local home CLI Magic Aquarium directory. So this is a very handy thing. And if I, if I just go in to that directory now, I'm basically looking at what's on the remote system in my home directory there. So this is the directory that I was running the netcat server and saving the files into. Very descriptive name. I'm often known for my excessive, uh, excessively long and descriptive file names and variable names. I actually got made fun of in high school for it. Um, one time in music theory class I went to go use the computer and found a file called making fun of people who use long file names dot muse <laughs> and yeah back then I didn't really find it that funny but now it's kind of funny so here's the files that were sent and you know they're not very descriptive the the only thing that you can see is the time that they were not the time that they were uploaded, but the time that Netcat started running. So essentially, every number you see will be for the upload time of the previous file. And of course, you can see the size. Some of them rather large. Uh, I can take a look to see. I can order them by size by using ls-l, capital S will sort by size. And usually I say R for reverse so that it goes in ascending order so the largest are at the bottom of the list and H is for human readable so you can get like megabytes and kilobytes and stuff so this is the order uh, this access log file it was basically I wanted to uh, keep a log of who was sending like by IP address and stuff uh, just in case somebody tried to hack me or something and I want to go back and and check it out um, I'm proud of you all. Nobody actually tried to hack me, and I, I was impressed. You're all a bunch of good white hat people, um, or gray hats at least. So I was a bit nervous about actually opening it up because who knows what somebody might try, and maybe there's some security vulnerability in Netcat that I should have considered or something. Anyways, so we have some a few large files. Most of the files are small. Um, there's several blank files, and that's basically where uh, somebody opened a connection and just closed it, and they didn't send anything. Um, so I can see... 
I can say find size zero. And that's those are all the files that are just blank. What I'm going to do is just put those files aside so they're they're not in the way. I can do this with exec mv So I'm using find here on the current directory. The size of uh, files are zero bytes. Um, actually, I don't need to use this ls anymore here. If I do, it'll just list out as it actually runs on them. And then I exec the command for each file. Move uh, this open and close curly braces gets replaced with the name of each file. And then I'm moving into the blank files directory, and you have to put this backslash semicolon at the end to tell exec that that's the end of its argument. All right. <laughs> One thing you need to make sure you do when you are moving, basically matching files, is that find will end up matching its own files that it's putting into in our place, and you have to watch out for that because you could end up clobbering files. So usually what you do is you put like max depth is one and that would just only match the files in the current directory. So you need to do a little bit more qualification uh, otherwise you're going to end up clobbering your own files. Learn from my mistakes. Okay so we'll go through this uh, quickly. Um, probably the first thing I'll do is just run file on all these files so that will tell me what type of data is inside of them. Even though I don't have any kind of file name or file name extension, I could still run this file command so I can see what kind of uh, magic bytes are at the beginning of the file. Uh, magic bytes are, a, what is it? It's a set of two bytes at the beginning of the file that, that signif like in binary files, like a ping or a movie or you know, a WAV file or, or something. It's something that signifies what type of file it is. And there's a wiki, there's a good Wikipedia article on magic bytes that you should look up and it's a good thing to understand if you're, you know, doing a lot of computer stuff when working with data because it, it it's something that's universal to computers. It's not I mean, they don't have to do it that way, but it's something that's done pretty much every on every operating system so it's worth knowing okay so we have ASCII text files uh, showing the directory there that I just created some a couple of JPEG images uh, ASCII English text with control line you know carriage return line feed uh, terminator so that's DOS text and HTML document text, a ping image, a very short file. That's probably one single byte, so maybe somebody just hit a letter. Uh, ping image, a bzip, uh, compressed data, an MPEG file, so that's an MPEG3 file, and a Perl script, and a few more JPEG images and ASCII text. So I'll just look at Hello, I'm not catting a file, I'm just typing. Easier that way. Netcat is great for fun stuff like this. Really flexible tool. Technically illegal in some countries because it can be used as a hacking tool. They have no concept of dual purpose. How very true. I'm not sure where it could be considered illegal um, I guess, you know, well, uh, that's a whole nother discussion, really. 